I'm BB Miniatures, and welcome to my latest tutorial. Games Workshop has kindly sent me the new Mechanicum Army box set in the Horus Heresy, and I've chosen to dive right in with the new Castellax model. Now, as we get some finally these amazing new plastic sculpts where, you know, we get mold, no more mold slipping, really nice and squared out parts with no warping from our resin relatives from Forge World, you know, of the past. But in my build, the only thing I've changed is actually the multi melta cable. Then there, I've replaced it with a putty cable made from Tamiya Smooth Putty, and I rolled that with a roller mold from Green Stuff World. You can use Green Stuff or even Milliput if you like, as these are alters work just fine. But I've rolled it up and gave it a few hours to cure, so it's quite stiff, but not entirely solid, so that I can shape it and used super glue to, you know, position and stick it in place. This I did because it allows me to reposition the shoulder gun to a more relaxing standby position and not directly forward as the plastic cable supplied unfortunately is rigid and only allows for a single position for the gun to be mounted. I guess, you know, you could say that's the only thing that I actually do miss about resin is the ability to easily heat up a part with a hairdryer and bend it into shape desired to have it stay in place once it's cooled. But coming right up with this tutorial, you know, just to let you know, I'll be using a combination of airbrushing, acrylic paints, as well as some oil paints and pigments. So with these materials, please take safety measures in the form of, you know, a good respirator, Good ventilation in particular to the airbrushing because we will be using a lot of open thinners such as white spirits in the process. You know, no one likes feeling ill from this stuff. So, you know, just crack open a window, mask up, and of course, have a lot of fun painting with these other tools and mediums. So as seen here, this model is being painted up as an allied cohort for my 5th Legion White Scars. And by accident... It is not related to Xana of the Dark Mechanicum at all. My good friend Eric pointed that out saying, you know, John would be in love to see this represented as Xana, but sadly, no. Of course, with this paint scheme, how it looks very close to it, if not almost a accidental copy, um, feel free to use this tutorial in place of the Xana Mechanicum and just replace the decals with theirs. You don't have to do much else. And of course, just before we start the tutorial, I have to do my due diligence YouTube plug as my channel, as well as my Patreon. You know, I just, you know, I put a lot of love and dedication to this hobby, making it a full-time career. And I appreciate a lovely like, subscribe, and comments on all forms are very welcome. And of course, if you want more in-depth tutorials ranging from detailed weathering of a, you know, Lehman Ross battle tanks, to detailed army centerpieces and future golden demon entries, consider becoming a patron where I have over 200 plus hours of video tutorials ranging from multi-part projects to a whole catalog dedicated to fundamentals. Learn to paint from my perspective and supporters also get connected on our own private Discord channel where, um, where members can uh, share, give feedback, share creative ideas, and just really just help one another grow as artists and as miniature painters. So, okay, enough with the plug. Let's get right to it. Let's get our paints, our airbrushes ready, and let's get started. All right, so we're going to start off with the airbrush, going with a base coat of NATO Brown from uh, Tamiya. Probably my favorite airbrush paint. And um, if I can help it, I always want to try to incorporate uh, these colors just because, you know, they airbrush so nice and smooth. And right there, just using their brand of thinner, their X20A. Um, if you're ever going to go and buy their thinner, make sure to get the X20A version. There's an X20 and there's an X20A. And um, the A stands for acrylic. So don't get the non-A version because then you're going to be mixing thinners and all that kind of stuff, which is getting kind of ugly. Um, we're just going to be base coating the miniature here, and I'm mainly, of course, concentrating on the armor panels of the Castellax. I don't mind if it goes into overspray on the other joint parts, 
you could mask this off if you wanted to but <laughs> the, the, it, it, it'd be a lot of work extra work um, just trying to mask it off and I'd rather just paint that separately I'm using a harder Steinbeck evolution um, with a 0.4 needle and I like to set my airbrush around two bars around 28 psi as well as the ratio from paint to thinner is around a one to one um, that way you know it's always better to spray multiple thin coats with the airbrush rather than trying to heavily rely on a single large one so as soon as I get an area painted and it looks fairly wet I just keep moving along try not to paint over very wet areas you'll end up blowing around the paint that's trying to dry unevenness and just looks kind of uh doesn't get a very nice coverage next off for the first highlight color is with that zandri dust again with Gaines workshops or citadel paint we can use we can still use the x20a thinner which is nice but i also recommend if you are using other paints um i use commonly uh with my um with my paint collections i mostly use ak and scale 75 as well use their respective thinners especially with if you're going to try to mix tanya's x20a with ak third gen paints part of the time it starts to gel out and it has like you know it doesn't have like a, a, a very good uh, mixture in between them so generally try to stay within uh, the paint and thinner family range but for games workshop or for the citadel paints i like using um, tamiya's x28 thinner and again same paint to thinner ratio you're looking around at least one to one so one part water to one part paint same psi and again just trying to we're going to be focusing the highlights mainly on the apexes of all the curves just uh, using very thin layers and slowly going over areas and of course building it up by keeping your airbrush very very thin as well as watching your trigger control the idea here is i never want to paint fully open and what i mean by fully open is pulling the trigger all the way back for the maximum amount of paint i always want to get a very small amount of paint and slowly build this up this will result in much nicer and softer fades more control with the airbrush and just even just with a single coat of paint as you can see the first application just on the shoulder there we can then do multiple another layer on top of the where the light should gather or on, again on the apex of the curve of the shoulder to increase the uh, the density of the layer and bringing more um, opacity and saturation so you know the nice thing is we can keep it nice under control keep it nice and thin and have a very smooth layer applications with their airbrush as well as even with uh, you know, painting with a uh, thinner paint it's uh, less prone for clogging um, but another thing you always want to keep an eye on when you're airbrushing is just be very mindful of the tip of the airbrush so you can see that I've actually removed the guard off the airbrushes I like to do that just so it gives me a little easier access to the very tip of the needle just because throughout the process of airbrushing sometimes we get a little bit of paint buildup that's at the end of the nozzle and that could cause it to not give us a nice smooth and evenly round pattern so uh, i will either take it with gently with my finger or maybe a q-tip with a little bit of airbrush cleaning solution just kind of moist in there and just kind of run it gently along the tip to remove any excess buildup or dried up paint that's going to be accumulating along the tip there just to you know keep the airbrush running nice and smooth and we don't get any irregular shots or splotches that get projected onto the model which is uh, always unfortunate when it does happen so best to uh, get in the habit and keep those things in check as I move around the model. And that's pretty much what it's going to take a look like when we finish all of the panels. And then we can prep the color and get ready for our next color that we're going to place onto there. And that is Ushabdi Bone, another Citadel color. And again, with the same mixture, we were doing one-to-one 
one part uh, thinner to one part paint and again using uh, Tommy's X20A and this time with the lighter application we can just focus those highlights even into an even smaller area of the curvature and if you notice I always like to start with the biggest surface and that is the, the top of the Castellax which um, initially I thought that was the round part was the head but actually the the skull that's just below it is um i think it's supposed to be technically the head i don't know but either way you get the idea you know focusing our light at the apex of that curve making that area just a little bit more round as well as uh especially on the front part of the castellax's body slash whatever you think is the head you notice i'm going to focus the majority of the highlights at the very very front to uh, again looking at the the big apex of the curve there and just you know giving us a nice highlight and really uh, pushing out those volumes a little bit more the other thing you will notice uh, like I said in the introduction is that don't be afraid to go lighter in this stage because um, later on when we move into the process of doing the oil washes adding the blacks the metallics everything all the darker things are coming which will really reduce the brightness of the model so when you're doing the armor like uh, as we're doing here just keep in mind it's okay to go a lot lighter in this stage especially it might look a little you know uh, judging it now and going ah that doesn't look i don't know quote unquote grim dark enough or it doesn't look grimy enough well that is not happening right now but it's a lot easier to have a lot more brighter and vibrant colors and we tone them down just through uh, you know just through the process of the oil and weathering and shipping process as it happens now for not the most thrilling stages or the initial thrilling stages blacking out everything by the brush this is probably the most boring part of the process but we still need to get it done and uh, you know trying to keep your focus up because um, you know we did all this nice airbrushing work and the last thing we want to do is completely fudge it up with uh, with a bunch of um, you know mist brushes with our uh, what I'm using here is rubber black by AK now if you really want to you can just make all these dark uh these dark uh, rubber black parts all metallic if you want you know you could just follow the same thing by skipping out later and just doing this all in steel but as i like to do i like to show different materials and different finishes of of metal and steel and all that kind of stuff on the model just to give a little more detail into it I don't think you know not there's not going to be one grade of steel or you know metal that's going to be used through its entire construction you know um, in this case i wanted to make more of the skeletal limbs within there yeah again like a dark steel almost like you know maybe a little bit like cast iron or, or whatever you can use your imagination there or like gun metal like very very hard gun metal with no not much metallic actually showing it's more like a coating onto there and then um you know showing those differences as well as the differences that maybe in the tubing and all that other things so if you want to paint it this way of course hopefully because you're watching it now i'll start just doing some simple highlights on this rubber black and just by taking some of our Ushapti bone on a palette and just mixing it a little bit into our rubber black to get a highlight, I just start um, pretty much placing uh, some highlights onto the model. Now, I like doing a mixture. This is like a very loose interpretation of volumetric highlights. But the nice thing is by just holding holding the model under the lamp and even, even the picture here, you can actually see even just with a single coat of rubber black, you can see some variations on where the light is hitting and where it gets a little bit darker. And we can also use that as a guide for painting onto here. The main areas of interest I'm really like looking at are especially the, these knee joints, uh, this frontal like kind of uh, part of the shin, I guess, of, of the robot that's very um, 
you know, visible as well as the, the arms, especially around the, the pincers and stuff like that. And just going in here and just giving them a little bit of a highlight. You could just do edge highlights if you want, but I like to do a little bit of both. So just giving some edge highlights as well as very pronounced surfaces that are very much facing forward towards the light. Again, using the lamp as a little bit as a um, as a helpful guide to see where the light falls and just covering those areas just to give um, this kind of black metal a little bit more attention. And again, it's just for variation really, you know, just gives it a little bit more. To me, it makes it a little bit more interesting um, and just a little bit more uh, enjoyable to paint rather than just slapping on just silver and calling it a day but at the same time you know depending on where you want to place the most of your effort or you know how much time you really want to put into your miniatures even though this is you know very suitable for a tabletop miniature maybe you want to spend most of your energy on the chipping and you know rust streaks and just make this all like a darker silver or you know it's totally up to you you know, I like to, you know, give a little bit of detail all around the model while still trying to, you know, keep it fair relaxed so I don't have to, you know, we're not painting a, a golden demon entry or anything like that. But, um, you know, if you ever thinking about improving your painting, sometimes it's just taking one extra element that you would uh, go a little bit uh, quicker on maybe that'd be like a two-stage thing where you just do you know a, a silver like a gun metal and then wash it with like non oil or something maybe to elevate your gaming miniatures to the next is put in an extra step or two into that process so you know giving a little bit more detail into there and slowly raising um, the amount of detail that you are doing you know it doesn't have to be like guns out blazing on every single element sometimes it's just picking a thing that you're custom to do and deciding to go a few extra steps in one area to you know increase the increase your like painting increase the fidelity of your army and that way you know it's more like a progressive step rather than you know trying to do everything all at once and then finding out you know, you get quite burnt out after a while, you know, um, just like any kind of like, you know, weight training and stuff, you know, you're not just going to go into the gym and pick up like 500 pounds right away or anything like that. You're going to, you're going to take your time and you're going to progress up there. For the, uh, you know, the cumulative stage highlights, you know, just adding some more Ushapti bone into the mix. Um, you know, you can just take out any sorts of grays, but I'm always a fan of trying to, like, I kind of like limit my palette a little bit, you know, just using Ushapti bone because it's, you know, it's already on, it's already out and I don't have to reach for more paints and just mixing into gray just works fine and has a little bit more harmony with everything. But to help you with any of these, um, to help you with, uh, some volumetric, just simple volumetric brushwork and you know, helping you get um, a pseudo blend because I'm not actually going to be spending any time at all blending in between layers. A, key, a big key thing is actually your brush direction and where where your brush stroke starts and where it ends. So if you really want to have like a nice, like a softer transition uh, of these different layers of paint, do your best to always try to brush in the direction of the main highlight. So, you know, you'll start on the outside and push the paint in towards the very center of the, of the volume itself. And what that will do is it will, uh, it will allow just a little more pigment to gather at the end and where you started your, your brush stroke will just have a bit of a, a softer edge. Um, so it, the transition is just a little bit, not so, um, not so stark it has just a little bit of a softer um a softer edge to it and that'll just help you out there but other than that just with a little bit of 
um, the paint is actually not thinned out too much, especially because I'm painting this in the summer. <laughs> it's hot. So thinning out your thinning out your paint um, on the wet palette, um, it'll dry out really, really fast. So to combat this on hot days is actually instead of um, in between when you rinse your brush in your cup, what you can do instead of wiping the paintbrush dry, just dab it once or twice on a paper towel, but leaving the moisture in the brush. Then when you can pick up the paint from the wet palette and with this paint, it doesn't have to be very diluted at all. The paint will dilute within the brush rather than having the, the proper dilution already set on the palette. This will uh, still let you paint with um, a little bit of dilution in in the brush and going onto the surface, making uh, your paint marks a little bit softer and easier. But also it won't dry out your mixture on your wet palette nearly as fast. Is because, um, yeah, we didn't, um, you know, thinning out the paint and being a hot day, it will dry out faster, even on a wet palette. But this method will, um, you know, just allow you to uh, have the have the paint last longer without drying up too fast. Here's a good, uh, easy demonstration within this circular part. See how all my brush strokes are going into the center or the apex of that cylinder highlight. You know, it doesn't have to be like super fancy again, you know, but just having a few of those highlights and it's always more important that the highlight is in the right position. So just taking our little idea of various shapes. So cylinders always have the, uh, always have the highlight running along the length of the cylinder. And, um, you know, for spheres, just pick the and I just pick a top apex and gather all the light in a in a circular fashion and you can't go too wrong from there. Besides, when we get the oil wash, oil wash is correct all <laughs> for the most part. So, you know, you don't have to be too exact. I'm just going around and filling up various areas and the areas that stick out the furthest. I generally give a little more attention to the highlights, but the more recessed parts, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't, you don't see it too much. So now we're on to more chipping and yeah, we're using Ushabdi bone again. Now before, like you think to yourself, wait, we used Ushabdi bone on the highlight for the airbrush. So, but if you use the, if you use the same color with your brush, it'll actually come out a lot brighter is because of just the, the, the paint from our brush is a lot more pigment dense. Um, the airbrush that the, the paint that we use the airbrush is a lot thinner, so it doesn't get the same amount of, um, power as it does from a brush. Um, so yeah, we can still use the same color and I'm just applying little chips just all by brush by hand doing little dots you know, focusing a lot on the edges in particular. But if you notice, I really like to do like dots and dashes, you know, that just allows that a little bit of space in between. I don't want to run the entire um, length of like these edge highlights perfectly just with one long line. I want to break them up into tiny little dots here. And that'll give us the impression that the surface of this is not nearly as smooth is not very smooth at all it's it's very roughed up and and dinged out and these lighter chips here are just like a foundation so like and will also simulate you know like little bits of irregularities as well as chips and abrasions that haven't actually dug deep into the actual paint of the of the castellax in the in the world itself it's more like chipping the top coat um, and hasn't necessarily penetrated through the several layers of paint and, and, and top coat protectiveness uh, protection that this would receive in, you know, supposedly the 41st millennium and uh, just offers up a nice foundation. So when we get to the darker chips, we can use these as guides. And as you can see, um, when we get to that, um, you'll see the effect that happens when we do these two chips.
So here we go. Now for the darker ones, and I'm just going to use Rhinox Hide. One of my favorite colors for doing darker chips. It's got a little bit of like, you know, reddishness to it, which I really like. And then when we pair that with the um, oil wash and the rust colors that we'll use later on, I think they help uh, complement pretty well. But any dark brown really will do. You know, you can even use like burnt umber or, uh, you know, plenty of other browns out there. But again, I'm doing the same type of patterns that I've been uh, using with the Ushap de Bone going over them. Now, I don't have not specifically aiming inside of each Ushap de Bone chip. Some of them, yes, but other ones, no. Like I can go off the beaten path. But the nice thing is when you do uh, use some of the Ushap de Bone chips as a guide, you can put them on the, you can put these chips more on the inside and it actually start to, it'll, it'll look also as if, you know, this chip has gone deeper into, you know, through all the layers of paint and chipped into the steel armor itself and discoloring it with dirt, grime and all the other nasty things that are encountered in the battlefield that stain it dark. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So again, you can see some of them that I have gone over those uh, areas of the white and the other other parts, which I just, um, you know, trailed off and made my own chips with uh, without any um, pre guiding parts from the Ushabi. This can also be done by with a sponge too i bet um, for people that have seen chipping that can be done but i quite like doing it by brush i find i just get a little bit uh, more control and i just like the uh, pretty much like the look and the patterns that i've created um you know and having a little bit of a hand in in it rather than just using the sponge i find sometimes the sponge uh, starts to group chips a little too condensely and uh you know but pick your weapon however you want to do it next off now we're gonna actually get into some metallics so th the first metallic here i'm using um so probably some of my favorite metallics of the line is from vallejo um, metal color and this is a uh, exhaust manifold um, now you don't have to do a pre-coat of black on top, but if you really want your metallics to, I think, come out stronger and better, it's always better to, I think it's always uh, beneficial to give a black undercoat prior to putting down metallics. Um, just because it just gives it a little, uh, I think they just cover nicely over black, it gets a better look to it. Because um, most metallics don't have like the best coverage to be honest you know our glitter paint doesn't always want to go over other colors as nicely but when it goes over black it's i think it looks really solid and it just contributes naturally to um to the the shading process too even if if even if some a, a few you know areas of paint that we're using our metallics don't necessarily get the best coverage the black is so forgiving that you know we don't even I don't think we really notice it at all. Um, you can see here that even though I've painted initially, I painted the flamer um, with that uh, black, uh, with our rubber black um, steel look. I changed my mind and I just made the entire gun metal as well as uh, just painting the barrel of the multi melta in the same fashion. You know, you can always change your mind. <laughs> and again like i said before it's just a matter of preference and wanting to illustrate a few different uh materials and metals into here you know even maybe more so on yours maybe you want to paint some areas more of a copper color or maybe some gold if you want to have a little more embellishment and in this case is i see i have painted the the upper mechanical parts in the rear all of uh, this exhaust manifold as well and then yeah i even made the, the the undercover there more 
to take out the finer steel with uh again Vallejo model colors chrome this stuff's awesome it is so bright and what i really like to do is i took this from what i used to do with uh you know, titanicus with all the um with all the pistons and stuff is this is where i'll take the chrome and put it all over the pistons again it, it's to just show to illustrate little variations and differences in metal maybe, maybe you won't see it as much as but you know being the painter i know it's there so it's cool all right now it's time for some freehand and um just for FYI, for people wondering what this actually says, it just says uh, it's in Chinese, Chinese. Uh, so hopefully I said that right. <laughs> um, what I did is just for the idea with my white scars, um, I think like Castellax and having like these, you know, like human human souls ripped and, and placing pretty much like their brain in robotic bodies has got to be one of the most terrifying and disgusting things that maybe that the people of Chagoris uh, would think and especially very superstitious even you know especially when if they think that red knots are just such a a terrible or like very uncomfortable thing to to see and to um you know be placed in i can't just imagine how much horrifying uh the mechanicum versions are so my idea just for you know lore sake and you know some canon that i create for myself is that um all the mechanicum robots um are all marked with this on the side and it's more of um you know just a, a warning label <laughs> and just a, a, a like a just to clearly pronounce that this is almost like a, uh, a zombie in a sense. And that's pretty much what this is from like old Chinese uh, folklore is these are supposed to be like kind of like a hopping undead zombies that go out and, you know, either like kind of like steal your energy, steal your chi. <laughs> and, but I think of them as like, I guess to fit in the white scars and to fit alongside them, it's like a barely tolerable evil that they that they employ and i think they only like my idea is like they only employ them in the, the worst battlefield conditions like and, and like sieges and stuff like that you know where they don't probably want to risk um you know astartes lives on on a meaningless or a very like meat grinderish task they'll just send a bunch of robots in there so yeah, that's what I'm marking up on here. And uh, yeah, it, you know, the, the freehand stuff's quite fun. And, you know, just adding little personalizations to your, um, you know, to your Castlax, especially if, you know, you're gonna use this in an allied force with, you know, any one of the 18 legions. I think it's like a really good opportunity maybe to, you know, um, to think about your, uh, think about, you know how you want to incorporate him and maybe like markings or whatever that could uh make them look a little more fitting within your legion some uh some people have even asked me especially at the club here and stuff you know thinking about like oh why don't you use uh like you know like white scars emblems maybe like the legion symbol or whatever and my idea is, is that only the sons of Jagatai are like honorable enough and and have the privilege to, you know, wear the Ordu of Jagatai, the the Legion, the Legion icon, as well as even the even the um, the sawtooth pattern. I think is only reserved for the Legion members themselves. Even with if you catch my uh, my paintings or my Solar Auxilia which I've also um, made it to be attached to the fifth legion that the only things that they have on their on their iconography is using the the imperial numeral five and then and Chagorin script so again like even the solar auxilia don't get 
the legion icon or b they don't get to have the the, the legion symbol or or the um or the sawtooth pattern that are very well seen within the white scars so the mechanic can get a similar treatment so when it gets to the decals they only get some chagorn writing on the head and then the the imperial fifth legion uh fifth legion designation of that roman or that numeral five and that's it some other tips for you when you're doing your own freehand i can't stress this enough is just go out there and grab a piece of paper and draw the design out preferably trying to draw also the design with a pencil or a pen to the same scale that you're doing this will just you know greatly increase uh, you know your motor control and getting a better stronger picture of what you want or directly copying it so you're not um, you know being too hesitant when you're actually coming to paint on the model as well as I think it's fair to say to bust out your best detail brush nice sharp point and just you know taking your time and following the guide of either a preset pattern that you found on the internet or also you know your drawing so you can better execute it and when it comes to getting that paint on the model and do it with confidence all right so i didn't show it but you know applying your decals with you know microset microsol doing the and then finishing off the matte varnish in preparation for the oils here i have a little container here and i'm going to be using um, some burnt umber from windsor newton and just some odorless thinner or if you have like white spirit that'll work too i like using i bought this new container here and um, the nice thing is when you make these oil washes you can always these oils last a really long time <laughs> they don't dry out anytime quickly and the nice thing is i can always like go back um, you know open up this container the next day or two and it'll still be good to go so when you make that oil wash see how it just placed a little bit in the tin there oil it some thinner and just start, start uh, mixing it and making it into a wash the other part you're going to see here in a second i'm going to grab a little um, blob of the paint and i'm going to rub it and leave it up on the side the top side of the container that way it's not in the thinner any longer and if i need to make some thicker applications or i need to you know make the the wash uh, a little bit stronger i can just pull in a little more of the paint at a time into here and uh you know go for it and applying the oil wash is some of the most forgiving things in, in our hobby and really good, especially for like mechanicum and robotic, um, robotic models, which are like, you know, this is just all various forms of, of metal and steel and cables and such. And, you know, I'm trying not to, I don't want to like completely like dump this on over the entire model. You know, I like to try to evenly coat areas the best I can you know just running it through a nicer like a like I'm using just a, a rounder brush by AK I'm not trying to bust out you know your um your Kalinsky sable brushes at all no these are synthetic brushes you know not uh, not expensive at all and it's just you know just to protect our Kalinsky brushes from the thinners that are being used no sense on like destroying brushes just by doing a wash here and just gently going through all the areas and giving um you know at first a single application but later on if you feel like there's some areas that you want to increase um go right ahead and go for it the nice thing is with oils you've got a really long working time so there's like that's what i also like about this it's very very um stress free you know this is this stuff's going to take a day at least to dry and that's the thing I'll be doing is after I coat this all up and I'm happy with it, I'm going to leave it for the day. So essentially I do this near the end of the day. I just let it sit on my desk overnight and I come back to it the next, uh, the next day and it's like ready to go and ready to paint again. And here it's more like, especially with the wash, you know, you have a lot of time to manipulate like the puddle. You can see like little puddles of paint all over the place and you can just move them around 
and here's it up. After it's done, I can just give that a close and it's ready to go for the next day or the day after. Because maybe after it's dry, finding some spots that I didn't like, you know, maybe I can apply more. But in this case, is I found some areas, I went for lunch, come back, and now it's still wet. And what you can do here when it's, you know, it's only been uh, drying for just over almost an hour and a half. I'm still going back here and I'm just taking some clean thinner with my brush and just actually uh, moving the moving the wash and the pigment around a little bit. I can see some areas that's kind of gathered in the midpoints, especially I'm trying to protect a little more of the highlights. See, I have like those, um, you know, the brighter highlights on the shoulders. I want the more of that, the lighter value to show. So just by taking a little bit of thinner and pulling some of the wash away from that, I can leave those highlights. Now this is what the model looks like the next day. See, it, and it dries really nice kind of matte looking as well. So, you know, the oil wash just looks really great, but you just have to remember, just give it some time. Don't try to over rush this and give it a nice, at least like 12 hours or more to dry. But now onto the lens details. I think like these little details here, um, like I said earlier, like if you're looking for like one or, or two areas to really like help make your models pop, this could be one of them by taking these, uh, you know, extra details like these lenses here. And for some simple lenses, first off, I'll just base coat the entire lens, this Galvorback Red from Citadel. And yeah, even those tiny ones. Next off is going to be Mephiston Red. Now, you should choose which side, the top left or the top right, where you want the light to come from, where we're going to place these highlights. So in this instance, I'm going to place them all on the top left. Now, in order for these, especially we have two lenses or like one on each side, to prevent them to look like they're making or looking like they're cross-eyed, put both highlights in either the top left or the top right. In this instance here, I've chosen the top left. Don't put one on the left and the other one on the right. It looks kind of funny, and then when you look at it, you'll see it looks like they're cross-eyed. Um, so try to avoid that as much as you can. And then with subsequent highlights after the Mephiston Red, I've just taken some Mephiston Red and mixed in some white, and you're gonna get a pinkish color. Just with a little bit of dilution, not too much, and make sure you know you're getting a detail brush out here. So I'm just using an Artisopus size double zero onto here, just so I can get a nice small point, and just putting another dot. And of course, that dot is the border is hugging the top left corner, and you know there's no even blending. It's just nice, simple layering. You don't need to, you know. You don't need to be doing glazing after glazing after glazing to do these lenses, especially for a tabletop model. You know, I think this, even from here, it's looking fine. And then the final highlight in here is going to be white, just with a pinch of that red in there. You could use pure white if you want to, but there's going to be actually one other highlight that's going to be pure white. So um, this one, I like to have with a little bit of red in there um, and, and yeah and then here's our final one we just take pure white or titanium white whatever you want and we're actually going to place you can place one big one and one small one or you can just place one single one and this one is in the opposite corner so instead of the top left we're going to put it at the bottom right but don't hug the very bottom so if you just take a look at the placement, I'm placing it more in the area of Galvorback. In the, uh, yeah, in the Galvorback, but kind of overlapping into the first layer of Mephiston Red. And that just gives us a little bit of um, like a highlight that's supposed to simulate light filtering through the lens, as it's called. And as a bonus, I'm going to take some Mephiston Red, water it down into the glaze by adding 
It is a fairly thick glaze to be honest. So this is around three to four parts water to one part paint. And just using this and painting it along the entire rim of that of the uh, of the lens itself and this just gives us a little bit of the illusion that a little bit of light you know some light is being projected and influencing the immediate surrounding area uh, of the lens and you know i think i quite like the look of that and to top it off to make it look even shinier we'll actually take some gloss varnish you know, it doesn't have to be diluted at all. You can just dab it in there and uh, give it a nice, nice, generous coat. Ooh, maybe that was too generous. <laughs> dab some of the gloss varnish off and just place it in there as so and just let that dry. And uh, right there, some easy lenses you can do. And I know the Mechanicum has a lot in there and even Space Marines too with all like their guns and shit. Cool. All right, steel highlights. So we're back onto the metallics. So now I'm going to take more from a uh, Vallejo um, metal color, and this is steel, so a lot brighter. Now, I like the reason I'm also doing this now is after the oil wash is all done, it has dulled down our exhaust manifold. So now we're just essentially highlighting our metallics by giving it um, some brighter areas to go by. Very similar to the chipping idea is, is that I want to make a little bit of the some of the edge highlights a little irregular, you know, not not as much as the chipping, but sometimes just leaving like tiny little gaps in between to again, just show a little bit of roughness in the metal and just a little bit of like natural weathering as well as I don't go nearly as strong and ham as you would with the dark chipping that we did with the with the Rhinox hide, but taking some of the steel and just doing a little chips on top of our dark of our of our Rhinox hide chips will um, give a little bit of impression of some fresh bare metal chips that just hit the surface and hasn't necessarily had any time for like grease and grime to penetrate the steel and discolor into that dark area as well as we can take some of this steel and you know besides going along chipping on the armor panels we can do little uh, chips and brush strokes along the dark steel metal that we've gone through as well as maybe even um you know, in areas you could also do this with a very light dry brush to just focusing mainly on the edges and um, just giving some metallic highlights on our dark metal to really um, just make some of the extra edges like pop out a little bit more and, uh, you know, leaving a really nice, um, really nice look on the metal and some variations on here. And again, like some of the chrome got dulled down from the uh, from the oil wash and just bringing those back up if you need to. All right, basing. Now I kind of screwed up on the recording. I'm very sorry, um, but the sand here is just done with uh, some acrylic uh, ground paste followed by a few different variations of ground cover. So from everything from very fine ballast all the way to bigger rocks and just it just uh, just adhesing that down with some watered PVA glue, letting that dry and then giving a base coat of burnt umber uh, paint. After the burnt umber paint, um, I know I'm going to be putting some of this flock on here, but there's also two forms of ground pigment onto there so there is um burnt umber as well as north african dust by ak and those are just those are just dry pigments that i have just slopped on directly with a really really scrappy shitty brush and then i would seal that onto the model running my airbrush with some uh ak's ultra matte varnish and spraying that directly onto the pigment 
and getting some of it even on the legs, don't worry about it. And that ultra matte varnish will then seal those pigments in there and without changing the coloration of the base at all. And then finally, I'm just taking some um, fine little dead grass patches from Gamer Grass and just placing them in with a little tweezer. Now for the final part, taking some uh, this uh, brush streaking um, rust from, I think it's from MIG, yeah, from MIG Ammo, and just a couple of tools. So I'm going to take a, a finer, an old Artist Opus number two. This one's retired, so I don't use it for my acrylic painting anymore, but I do keep it for metallics. And I'm going to be placing some rust streaks. So with this, like, this applicator, it comes with it. It's kind of, you know, you just start dabbing little areas where you want these rust streaks to place. If you're, you can also grab, uh, you can also use other tools from like AK or MIG again with other streaking products that either come as a thicker tube or, um, you know, a pre-mixed in a, it, just in a paint pot but they all act the same. This one just has a fancy applicator, so you need one less application brush. To be honest, eh, like if you have a choice between the two, just, I would just get a, just, I just get oil to paint, to be honest. But um, I thought I would try these uh, streaking brushes out again. I haven't used them in years. I, I was kind of digging through and trying to find them out there. So by applying it first and then using some thinner, we can manipulate the oil paint. First by taking a uh, dotting out, as you can see here, I dot a little bit of thinner on top of the area. And you'll see the oil paint kind of blossom bloom and kind of open up. And then we can use the brush to see how I'm just drawing it on the left and the right sides of the dot and I'll pull it down allowing that rush, uh, allowing that streaking to follow the brush mark and go downwards. For larger areas we can also use a different brush so we can use this flat brush that actually has some irregular cuts into there. It's specifically done for this. And we can use that. I'm using a dry without any thinner in there at the moment. I'm just pulling, um, I'm pulling those areas down and just giving, getting the streaking started. But then by taking a finer brush again, just having some, getting some thinner into there, making sure not to overload it, but dotting on top of the area where the streaking starts to kind of blossom out, to bloom out the the oil and then pulling them down again focusing not going directly on top of the area but just going from the left and just from the left to the right I find is the easiest way to get those streaks pulling down quite nicely and don't worry the nice thing is just like with oil wash and stuff this stuff dry it takes a long time to dry and if you screw up or you're like I'm not happy with that it's so easy just to literally get a q-tip or a paper towel whatever and just like rub it off and just start again as well as this streaking stuff doesn't have to be for streaking it's still just really just oil paint I know on the label says streaking but you can do more with it you know you don't have to do streaks in this case I just dab some areas to apply some that or rust part and just taking again some thinner with my brush and just manipulating it more like a wash and just placing those areas to give a little bit of a um, little bit of rust in the recesses and over the metal to again you know kind of match the <laughs> match the atmosphere and the vibe this guy is uh, going through he ain't the cleanest tool in the shed by far Definitely a nice, uh, a very big stark contrast to my white scars. You know, these guys are very, very dirty, not very well kept, kind of neglected, and even more so like the base. I wanted that contrast too, where all my scars are on really nice uh, grass plain fields with, with bamboo and such. These guys are just pretty much going to be on dead ground to further illustrate 
um, the differences and a big contrast between them and their Legion counterparts. Finally, what I found out doing is by instead of using the applicator, I would take paint off the side or of the rim of the, the container that's not as thinned out as it does come at the bottom of the application. And to reinforce uh, the starting points of the streaks, I would just use a little bit of this product and dab at the very beginning the 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 very very starting point of the rust itself just to give it a little bit more of a stronger stain and a focal point and sometimes again like what i'm going to do here is i'm going to reapply some of this and then go through the streaking process again and just like here see how like how much of the first attempt i pulled away you know, I want a little bit more, um, I want a little more of the effect to take place. So you can just easily just do a second layer and on top of the previous, um, the previous uh, attempt and just reinforce some of those streaks and maybe get a, a little bit more of a stronger presence onto there, onto the model. Again, super easy, really, really fun to do actually. And um, sometimes it doing this, I was actually thinking to myself about, oh, maybe I should paint a Death Guard model. Those are really fun because I find that Legion is so appropriate for this type of uh, of this type of effect. Even though I do find it funny that, you know, some models, especially like even just like Space Marines and Power Armor, I never really imagined them being very stationary. But in order for these rust streaks to occur, you know, you got to be like sitting there in the rain, motionless for a while. But I think it fits really well with these Castellacs in particular because, yeah, robots. Just go stand there. Go guard that gun or whatever. And that is it. Yeah, thanks again for joining me on this uh, this tutorial of the brand new Castlax from Games Workshop. Uh, I hope the the techniques I was showing you here gives you a really uh, good idea uh, of the techniques used and also the general workflow I like to um, paint my army stuff in. If you're taking a look now, this is a little bit of a bonus footage in in front of you here of me. Uh, getting called out for not drilling my <laughs> drilling the gun barrels of the multi melta um, so instead I am just going to um, paint the, uh, the stupid illusion that it is drilled simply by painting a black circle and then going to be taking uh, <laughs> some a lighter metallic I think yeah I took more of steel again and just painting the uh, painting the highlight of the lower bottom half rim, just so at least it looks like there is a there is a gun hole, like uh, there's an actual hole in, in the barrel, <laughs> rather than uh, me forgetting to take a pin vise and uh, you know tapping it. But um, again, if you really enjoyed this tutorial, it really helps me out a lot by giving me uh, a thumbs up. You know leave a comment if you have any questions or just want to say what's up um, they're always really appreciated i just always love hearing from you guys as well as uh, again subscribing to the channel if you already have it does help me a lot and if you want more tutorials and uh you know more tutorials and more in-depth painting and more um, advanced and display technique painting as well um, i do have a patreon where um, you can subscribe and gain access to, you know, oof, there's like over almost, almost 200 hours worth of tutorials now. It's been uh, just over, uh, you know, uh, quite a few years now. So um, there's a lot for you guys to learn. And I am always very, I try to be as active and very active on the Discord. And with, of course, um, memberships to the uh, uh, being a patron gives you access to that where you can connect with the rest of the community seek feedback you know share your creative uh you know share your creativity and you know help each other grow and become better painters 
All right, I'll leave you to this and we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks again and happy painting.